Hey folks, Jeff Kozlowski here. Thanks for tuning in to the latest episode of the K-Stream Podcast. Our guest this time around is Brian Piper. He is the Director of Content Strategy and Assessment at the University of Rochester. He also does a lot of speaking engagements as well as consulting around data analytics, content strategy, SEO, Web3, and NFTs. He's also in the process of writing a book. He's taking the lead on the second edition of Epic Content Marketing, originally by Joe Polizzi, so he's, he's working with him on that. I wanted to have Brian on to talk about how Web3 will affect video content specifically, not just the content, but the creators behind that content. How will Web3 affect how we promote ourselves? How will, how will it affect how we distribute our content, how we build community? Brian has been doing a lot of his own research in the Web3, NFT, crypto, blockchain space, and, and has a lot to say on the matter. So why don't we turn it over to the interview with Brian? Brian Piper, thank you so much for being on the show. How are you? I'm great, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I know we've been talking about this and trying to get it to happen for a while. So it's it's um, it's great to finally have you on. And it's funny, you know, we're acting like we haven't talked in a while. It's at the beginning of this, you know, podcast. It's always it uh, kind of awkward, like, oh, you know, we didn't just see each other yesterday or uh talk for a few minutes leading up to this thing. But anyway, that's how we have to start it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's the process. So I guess, you know, Brian, quickly, um, you know, let's get into, if you could give a brief introduction of yourself and kind of how you, you know, let's talk first about just kind of where you were before University of Rochester, or how that led to your role there now. And then maybe separately, we'll talk about how you kind of got into NFTs, Web3, and all that kind of stuff. You bet. Um, so I won't go back too far. I, I could go back to Rabbit Farm in Dogpatch, Arkansas, but let's skip all of that <laughs> and we'll go right to, um, you know, I was a, a web developer initially as a career choice, kind of really was just a job choice. It was just something to do to pay for my hobbies and outside activities. Wasn't really passionate about it, wasn't very talented at it. Um, actually, I was, uh, I was such a bad developer that they always made me do the web positioning is what they called it at the time. Now we all know it as SEO, uh -huh. but they were like, well, you don't re really need to be doing the coding. Why don't you just go over there and change the words so it shows up on the search engines? No one's ever going to want to have that done anyway. So you, mm. you just go do that, take care of that. So uh, back in 2013, I read a book called Epic Content Marketing, and that kind of changed my entire career path. Uh, I realized that you could, instead of selling people things and pitching your products, you could just provide information. You could become the expert in whatever field you were uh, working in and provide actual value to your consumers with your content by telling stories. I've always been a storyteller. So I jumped into that. I walked right down to our marketing department at the um, defense industry employer company that I was working for and told the VP of marketing that she needed to hire me to do their digital marketing. She uh, took a leap, leap of faith and hired me. We made a bunch of big changes, was doing a bunch of web optimization and content strategy. And that led me into my current position at the University of Rochester, where I oversee content strategy and assessment for the Office of Communications, but I get to work across the entire institute and work with all our different groups and organizations to try to help them look at their data and figure out what's working and what's not working and what we can do better and how we can collaborate more and present that unified brand message that we all want to deliver. And, you know, before this, I was watching another presentation you gave, um, I can't remember the organization it was for, but you did, you talked about just like, you know, since starting at University of Rochester, some of the success you've had in um, developing organic traffic, just hit on that for a second. I think, you know, you've seen kind of a nice increase in numbers in the time you've, you've been here, right? Yeah. So, you know, we have a, a ton of content and that's what I said yeah. when I came in for the interview. I was like, I, I looked through the landscape. I was like, wow, we make a lot of content. 
Um, so that was one of the things I really, you know, started to address initially was how do we choose what content we make and why don't we look at making really effective content and look at what's, what works um, and really focus on, you know, what our users are asking and what questions the community is asking that we can provide the answers to. Um, and in the first year, just through, you know, educating our content creators on how to do keyword research and how to think about what questions are being asked about that particular area. We were able to increase our organic traffic by about 150%. And then each year since then, we've got, you know, we've gone up like an additional like 70 or 80% every year. So it's great to see, you know, a lot more people coming and consuming our content and getting the answers they need. And, you know, it's a cycle as we increase our rankings on the search engines, more people come to our traffic and consume our content that causes our rankings to increase and it makes it easier for new content that we're creating to get picked up and to, to rank high on the search engines. And we've really been focusing on, you know, capturing the featured snippet and rich snippet positions and that's been working very well for us as well. Yeah, and this is uh, sort of random. At the beginning, you mentioned Arkansas. Are you originally from there? I was born in California, but when I was three, my mom and stepdad moved with my brother and I down to Arkansas, and I lived there until I graduated from high school. Okay, I don't, I don't know if I've ever met anybody that, well, at least lived that long in Arkansas. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're probably excited to is is like is I don't know, you know, I know Arkansas is you know, I guess a fairly big state is, is little rock. You know, that's the capital. But is that like fairly close to where you were from? It's about three hours South of oh, okay. where I'm from, but you know, I, I like to visit the area. I still have family and friends down there. So yeah. Yeah. It's great. So you're, you're probably extra excited about the Hyatt web yes, conference in October. I'm very glad it's in little rock. <laughs> It'll be a great opportunity to <laughs> go down there and it's a beautiful state. Uh, it's, it's, uh, got some amazing landscapes and environments that you don't really find anywhere else. So, yeah, well, I'm even more so looking forward to, to attending that one, but I, I digress. So we, you mentioned Epic content marketing, the book, um, Joe Polizzi, and you know, I've, you've mentioned before just, um, how reading that book has kind of changed the course of your career and the trajectory and kind of made you think like, okay, content marketing is a place I need to be. Um, so through, you, you know, I guess a couple things kind of come out of that relationship with Joe now, right? I mean, so one, I, I did that kind of, has he been kind of a part of your interest in the NFT world and Web3? And then also, I mean, it sounds like there is a part two of Epic Content Marketing coming out and you are heavily involved in that one. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, I blame Joe for a lot of things, um, <laughs> but in the best way possible. So I started once I came to the university and, and really started looking at uh, the content process that we had, the content strategy we had. And I recognized the need for an SEO project. Um, I was able to start in our department first kind of popularizing that and spreading the, the word about that, doing some training and doing some speaking. And once we started seeing some success, then I started moving across the institution and doing presentations and speaking workshops. And then I started going to industry conferences. So I started going to high ed web conferences and doing those presentations and workshops there. And I figured, well, if I can do it there, then I can go to content marketing world and do it there. So I've been to that conference a few times as an attendee. Two years ago, I presented there virtually for the first time. And then last year I presented there in person. And every year that I go to content marketing world, I would find Joe, I would take a selfie with him. I would tell him how his book changed my life and thank him for no longer being a unhappy web developer. And uh, so this previous year, I actually got to spend some good time with him, hang out with him. It was a much smaller conference because of COVID. Usually there's about 4,000 attendees. Last year there were 800. So it was a much more intimate group and everyone was super excited to be there and really looking for those networking in-person opportunities. 
And then shortly after the conference, I was in a Slack book club session and uh, asked Joe when he was going to do an updated edition of Epic Content Marketing. And he said, well, co-author it with me and we'll do it. So I'm in the midst of that right now. And uh, so that's very exciting and an amazing opportunity and getting to work with Joe and collaborate with him. But at the same time at, at Content Marketing World last year, he in one of our conversations, they asked me, he's like, so what do you know about NFTs and Web3? And I said, not much, really. I dabbled in crypto a little back in 2018 and kind of understood some of the concepts. And he said, well, you know, here's some of the use cases and here's some of the things I'm thinking about. And it really got me excited about the possibilities and the opportunities and looking, you know, being around for the beginnings of the internet and watching the adoption and the beginnings of social media and seeing how that was initially dismissed by so many people and, you know, the incredible impact that it's had on all of our lives. I could just recognize the technology and the capabilities in Web3 and it's a it's a fascinating area to be in. I've been diving deep into it for the last eight or nine months and involving myself in lots of different projects and opportunities. And there seems to be no shortage of innovation and different applications in this space across all different industries. So it's it's been really fascinating. And yeah, I, I definitely uh, attribute most of my interest in it to, to Joe and blame him directly for all the time that I have spent <laughs> chasing this. It's all his fault. Uh, I'm, I'm probably about a year behind you in diving into this stuff, but you know, I'm kind of, I was kind of the same way in, in preparing for this interview and just seeing some of the content you've been sharing on LinkedIn or, or others have been sharing on LinkedIn around web three, I've started doing a little bit of diving and I'm, I'm same way, just like, Oh my God, the possibilities are, um, just, just kind of mind boggling and, and really fascinating. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, web three for a second. Um, cause you know, I do want to, you know, I guess the, the, reason I wanted to to chat today is because, you know, I, I do talk a lot about video on this podcast, whether it be streaming or video creation. I just kind of wanted to chat about how Web3 will will affect um, video or, or, you know, video content creators and, and things along those lines. But first, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, what Web3 is. And, you know, it's funny, I, um, I back when I guess Web2.0 2, was new i remember seeing that term being thrown around out there and i was just like oh, i wonder what web one was and i i just never had the curiosity to to look um but now you know of course i'm talking about web three i was like okay maybe i should go maybe we should talk a little bit about what exactly came before so let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the web so what when people say web three what does that mean? And if you could just kind of say, okay, well, talk about like what web one was, web two, and how we got to where we are here with, with web three coming. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, it's really all technology based. So you'd have different capabilities in different iterations of the internet. So when we talk about web one, we're really talking about read only. So back in the beginning of the internet, it was very difficult to you know, create a website. You had to have coders and developers and you had to have a place to host it. It was very technical. So it was pretty much limited to you know, the bigger brands, bigger companies, and they would put their information up there and you would consume it. That was kind of, you know, it was very difficult to get much farther than that. You had to have some real serious technical knowledge we started getting into e-commerce. Uh, there were just platforms that were putting their content up there that you would go consume, you would go make, make your purchases on their platform. And then Web2 really changed that. It made the technology easier. Now it was kind of a read-write uh, paradigm. So we had content management systems that came out. So it made it easy for anybody to go in and you know create a website on their own. They didn't have to know how to code or they could have a developer set up the framework of the site and then they could go update their content. 
And this was also the, the age of social media. So this is when it was easy for everybody to just start posting out on the internet, start sharing your own thoughts. This was really, you know, the, the read, write generation, uh, the blogging started lots of user generated content. But one of the problems with that whole system is that everything was kind of owned by those big entities, right? Mm -hmm. So Amazon and uh, Apple and Twitter and Facebook, Meta now, um, you know, all, all your content was going out to live on their platforms and they controlled who saw your content and who it was shared with um, and really whether or not you could even have an account on their, on their site. So Web3 really gets into read, write, own. So Web3 is kind of all powered by blockchain technology. So blockchain is kind of the fundamental paradigm shifter of Web3. And all the blockchain is, it's a database. It's a publicly stored database that can't be changed. So it's like a permanent ledger that's stored on a bunch of different computers around the world. So no one really owns it can't really be hacked or changed once you write something to the blockchain it kind of exists there and you know the public blockchains are out there for everybody to see so they're very transparent you can go back at any point and see who did what in real time and you know everything that's written to the blockchain is time stamped um and, and blockchain's been around for a while i mean the concepts were were first came up in back in the 90s um but it didn't really start getting usage until cryptocurrencies came out. And that's that was really one of the first uh, iterations of blockchain that started getting adopted with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, so now you've got this permanent public ledger out there where people can see who owns what currencies. And then, you know, the, we started getting into NFTs. So... Uh, when we talk about NFTs, we need to talk about tokens. So there's two different kinds of tokens. There's you know, social tokens, um, which are fungible, and then there's non-fungible tokens. And all fungible means is that they're replaceable, they're interchangeable. Hmm. So if I give you a dollar, you can give me a dollar. It doesn't matter who has what dollar. Those are fungible assets. Yeah. But if you have a baseball card that's you know a Mickey Mantle first edition baseball card, that's a non-fungible token. If you give me a baseball card and I give you, you know, I don't know any baseball players, but if I give you a baseball card from today <laughs> that I just got out of the pack, it's going to have a different value. It's going to be very yeah. different. So, you know, those tokens are stored on the blockchain and they're written publicly so people can see who owns those. And then you could sell those to somebody else who wants to collect those particular mm -hmm. assets. So that so web three is kind of based on all of this, like you said, kind of blockchain NFT technology. Right. So it's it's basically the same as web two, except now we can prove who owns something and you can add in different code structures around that ownership. Mm -hmm. So but that's another, you know, aspect of these blockchain, um, this blockchain technology is that now some of these you can actually write code within the blockchain to facilitate certain things happening. So you don't, you no longer have to have a business contract. You could actually just write your contract into the blockchain and that helps define exactly how your organization's going to run or how your nft is used mm -hmm. or how your token gives access to your community for certain things interesting and and so talking specifically about video you know you mentioned with web 2 facebook twitter amazon the giants and part of that is youtube um and you know and in, in kind of doing some research for for this interview i was you know it just again kind of just fascinated by the concept so you know you think about youtube such a powerhouse right now for video and and creators and it's been wonderful just a place to share 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 work um uh you know comment um develop communities 
Uh, but again, you know, similar to all the other social media networks, it's it's on YouTube and at you know somewhere on there, it's like they have kind of rights to that content. And so, you know, it's I think it sounds like Web three um, is kind of shifting the power back to creators, um, you know, and all this this content data won't be given up to a centralized source anymore. Um, so I would imagine that's kind of, that's the exciting thing for creators. Right. And, and I would imagine too, it'll also kind of affect how video may be consumed in the future. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so typically in, in the past, the blockchain was just used to store the ownership contracts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you bought a piece of digital art, that digital art wasn't technically stored on the blockchain because it would take up too many spots. You know, the blockchain was for small amounts of data that basically just said, here's the transaction that happened. Uh, but now there are blockchain uh, technologies where they can actually store large amounts of data on the blockchain directly. So there are companies now that you can store your entire video. So there are feature length videos that are being sold as NFTs. Mm. Um, and um, Anthony Hopkins worked on one that just released, I think back in March, it was the first feature film that was entirely sold as an NFT. And then based on ownership of that NFT, you had certain access to certain things. So you could get some behind the scenes shots, you could get interviews. There were actually some of the NFTs that were sold where they would edit you into the movie. Wow. So all sorts of different opportunities <laughs> that you can have with NFTs that just don't exist in a traditional, you know, uh, uh, movie landscape. There are a lot of movies that are being funded by NFTs. So mm -hmm. people will make, you know, take clips from the movies, sell those to N uh, as NFTs. And then the money that comes in from those will help to actually, you know, help produce the film or distribute the film. So lots of different use that way. And then the other part of that ownership is you get rights to secondary sales. So when someone buys your NFT, let's say you're a video artist, you create video art in the typical world these days, if you sell that to someone and sell all the rights to that, they own it, they take it, they can do whatever they want with it. You can write your smart contract for your NFT however you want <laughs> so that anytime somebody else sells that down the road, you get a piece of ownership. You get a piece of that residual sale. So, you know, it's an opportunity for you to permanently own all the content you create, whether you want to give away the distribution rights, whether you want to keep those and just give away, you know, certain usage assets that uh, your owners of those NFT could use. Um, Top Shot did the same thing. They, they took famous basketball scenes sold those as nfts and now the holders of those can buy and sell those like cool animated video trading cards and they you know have been growing in value as these other collectors are looking to get just the, the right video that they want to own so all sorts of interesting uh different applications that are being explored. There was another uh, company that sold, it was an artist who sold an NFT and it was a uh, music video. And whoever owned the NFT, the first purchaser of the NFT got a right to name that music video. Mm. And I think that that was sold for $1.3 million or something like that. So wow, gives you different ways to affect this artistic content that that goes out there and and what you create and it has a permanent record of who created it and who owned it and where it got where it went and the lifetime of this of this project and 
in a way it kind of it'll the creator's handprint will always be on it and exactly kind of will always have some ownership there yeah yep definitely and it takes the you know it takes the middleman out of there there are um, artists who are releasing uh, the music artists who are releasing their songs and they don't have to find a producer they don't have to find a distributor they don't have to find a music label they can just sell them as nfts and if they have you know it used to be kevin kelly wrote an article about your thousand true fans yeah you had a thousand true fans that's all you needed that could support you as a creator um and so that article was adapted for web3 to say that really all you need is a hundred true fans if you have a hundred mm. true fans in web3 that are willing to buy your token, buy your NFT and hold in your economy and your community because they get access to you. And, you know, that can support an artist and support their project. That's why too, I think, you know, speaking to video creators out there, I guess any content creators, it's so important to build that community now. Right. And, and so, you know, when you, if and when the, um, you know creators make that switch over to you know somehow incorporating um, NFTs and and whatnot into their into their video work into their their creation, I mean they they have this support um, that can make it work. It seems like community is such a big part of Web three too. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, not only is it is it important to have a strong community but web3 really allows you to strengthen your community so you know a lot of these web3 communities that i've gotten into are tokenized so this creator tokens these creator coins these social tokens mm -hmm. as you come into the community there are certain areas of the community that are gated off unless you either purchase a certain amount of those tokens or by involving yourself in the community and contributing to the community, you can earn those tokens. Mm -hmm. So like in Joe's Discord and in his token economy, if you write blog posts for him, you can earn tokens, which can gain you access to those different levels and then you could use those tokens to pay for attendance to go to his conference. And by, by having those tokens and being involved in the community, it provides all your community members with that sense of ownership and that sense of collaboration. And I've had more opportunities for collaboration and gotten more project-based work from these you know, Discord communities and these Web3 communities than I ever have from from any other community. It's it's amazing the involvement and uh, activity in these different communities. Yeah, it seems like just the the possibilities are just. I mean, it sounds cliche, but the pos possibilities really are endless. It's it is just amazing the use cases. I've been looking at just how it's utilized in video games and music musicians seem to, you know, that it's such a, such a cool opportunity for, for musicians. I've, I saw an article about someone doing, um, virtual only tours, like just in yeah. the, in the metaverse or what, you know, it's like, yeah. but it's all based on this technology. It's just, um, it's fascinating. And then they, they will, see how that virtual audience builds and builds and then that'll determine maybe if they try to go in person and and so yep. it's just like wow you know like the more i read the more i'm just it's fast i'm fascinated yeah so this conference that i went to it's the the c e x conference this year was the first year that they had a in-person event and you know partly for uh, a fundraising to offset some of the initial costs of the conference and just to increase community and to give an opportunity for the the super fans in the community to get involved he sold never ending tickets which were nfts that gave you lifetime access to his conference for as long as you held them so it was great because I, I bought one of those and i paid probably the equivalent of three times the normal conference 
fee. So I figured, well, as long as I go three years, that will cover the cost of it. And then the nice thing is you can resell it at that point. So all I really needed was for him to have the conference for at least four years. (laughs) I'd be able to get my three years out of it and then resell it to somebody else at the end of that time. But yeah. But, the, you know, once we all got there and, you know, there were like 50 of us who had all purchased this never ending ticket, we all got on his discord. We were all collaborating. We were all talking, sharing stories. And then when we got to the conference, there were just incredible opportunities there for us. And the conference was amazing. And we were just so happy that we were all able to you know, invest not only in ourselves for that long-term gain from owning that ticket and forming that collaboration, but also to invest in Joe's vision of what this could be. And he was able to see the value that this was having to all of us. And then he used his NET holders to get up on stage and introduce the speakers and he didn't plan for any of us to get up there and talk about how great it was to have these NETs and hold them. But everybody that got up there to introduce the speakers ended up talking about the value they were getting out of this and, you know, the extra incentives and rewards that we were getting. And, you know, my wife actually ended up coming out to, to, for a few days vacation before the conference and we were having some conversations at dinner before the the day before the conference was going to start and with some other of other attendees and during that dinner she said i've got to stay for this this is an incredible conference there's incredible opportunities for networking and collaborating and one of the benefits of having this never ending ticket that this year that he decided at the last minute to give out was everyone could bring a guest if they wanted to. So my wife was able yeah. to come for free to the conference because I had this ticket. So it's things like that where the owner of the NFT, the the owner of the the founder of that community can add that extra utility whenever they want or they can reward members of their community in whatever way that they want to reward them because of their activity and their involvement. So it's a, it's a fascinating model. And, you know, the more that I see, you know, companies like Starbucks using it for loyalty rewards programs and uh, Estonia has been using blockchain to basically run their entire country uh, since early two thousands. And it just makes everything much easier. It makes, you know, managing hospital records easier. It makes your uh, managing ownership of your assets easier. It makes your taxes and voting. Everything's public. It's uh, available to see. Um, A lot of the, like all of your personal information is stored still in private networks. So none of that's available, but access is public. And you can see who you've given access to. So you don't have to, call the hospital and say, oh, I need my records transferred from you over to them and then wait until they actually do that. You can just go to your digital wallet on the blockchain and switch access yourself. You should be in charge of your own data. It's yours. Uh, But right now we don't own that because it's all stored by somebody else on their proprietary, you know, database. But on the blockchain, we would be able to control that and move that wherever we needed to. Yeah, it seems like it, even though, you know, I'm, so many people are taking advantage of the technology, it does. Um, it seems like so, so many are not, but it's it's moving that, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it does feel like more and more is moving in that direction. Um, and it's important to start familiarizing yourself with it if you're not. Um, it just, again, yeah, the, and it just seems like the, the, um, the use cases are just so like very much in their infancy almost, even though the concept's been around a while, it just seems like there's, there's just so much more to come. Yeah. And you know, the great thing about it is all these communities are looking for people to get involved. So there's Mm -hmm. these, these DAOs, they're called their decentralized autonomous organizations. So it's collaborators from all over the world who can get together for a specific cause or purpose and they can form a, you know, a a company that's not a legal entity, but it is a company as far as how it's governed and the rules around um, its purpose and everything can be stored on the blockchain. So everyone who joins can see exactly where the assets go 
exactly how it's going to be managed and governed. And then they can get together and find specific causes that they all want to collaborate on. And right now it's very easy to get into any of these. So if you have something that you're passionate about, you can join these communities and they'll figure out how they can use whatever skills you bring to the table to help benefit the community. And then, you know, based on how well the community does, you can end up benefiting from that. Yeah, it's it's also fascinating. And um, Brian, I won't take up much more of your time. Um, but before we go, I do want to make sure we chat quickly about when when the book is coming out and if you can give a like preview of what people can expect from it. Absolutely. Um, so it's uh, Epic Content Marketing, the second edition. And it is for content uh, marketers at brands, as well as for content entrepreneurs who have their own content business. And the book includes all of Joe's original fantastic content that he wrote in the first edition about the importance of finding your mission statement and figuring out what content your users need. And then I've added a, a bunch of information on how to optimize that content and make that content work and perform the best for you. And then we've added an entire section on, you know, machine learning and AI, because uh, obviously that's changed in the last 10 years. And then a large chunk of the book is also Web3, where it talks about, you know, the, the new technologies, the new applications and some of the different use cases and how content creators can use those to strengthen their community and help monetize their content. So I get it to, uh, we deliver it to the publisher next week, and it should be out in early 2023. Wow, that's exciting. Well, congrats uh, on that, Brian. And and last thing, if, if folks want to connect with you, where should they go? I am at Brian W. Piper on pretty much every social channel, or you can visit my website at brianwpiper.com. And yeah, always glad to connect and collaborate with uh, new people and explore new opportunities. Awesome. Well, Brian, this was so fascinating, um, educational, all of it. Um, I, I learned a ton and really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. My pleasure, Jeff. It was great talking with you. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too.